Hey YouTube, I'm Noah from Sparksite, and our goal is to make video easy. In our last video, we talked about the new line of AMD processors and how they fared for editing and animation. There was a lot we went over there, but the short of it is that the new line of Ryzen 5000 processors, especially the 5900X and the 5950X, look like a pretty amazing value for people interested in building a workstation. Of course, this all came with a pretty big caveat. If you can get one. Still to this day, those top two processors are basically impossible to find in stock anywhere, along with a number of other electronic stuff. It's just a really annoying time to try and buy PC hardware. But after months of trying, sitting on alert streams and waiting, ready to slam the add to cart button, I was actually able to get my hands on this, which is a Ryzen 9 5950X. I was originally eyeing the 5900X for my own personal system, as it seemed like a better value overall. But this thing became available and I jumped on it without really thinking very much. <laughs> Though, as you'll soon see, that may actually turn out to be a pretty good decision for what's coming on the horizon. Before I got this chip, I had exclusively used Intel for the PCs that I worked with. So there were a number of things I had to get accustomed to as I switched companies. After having to scour a number of places online myself, I figured it would be helpful to put what I learned together in one place for other people to access and maybe learn from. So here are, in no particular order, the things you should know before building a PC around Ryzen 5000, especially if you're used to working with Intel. First, I just want to talk about the different tiers of the processors themselves, because this was a pretty big part of my decision on which one I wanted to get. If you look at the price slash performance chart we did for After Effects in the last video, it would seem like the Ryzen 5 5600X is just an all-around phenomenal chip as it is a fair bit cheaper than the Intel i9-10900K, and yet beats it in raw performance, if only by a little bit. Now, I've had a few people ask me if it makes sense to just get the 5600X if you're on a budget and mostly work in After Effects. And yeah, if you are really constrained in terms of budget, this processor should serve you well. But I feel it's important to point out that there is a reason that this processor is cheaper. The 10900K has 10 cores, the 5600X only has six. And I know in the past I've said that core count doesn't matter in Adobe programs as much as people think, but there are two things that you should consider. The first is that more cores do help you when you have multiple programs open. If you are likely to have After Effects and Premiere and Audition and Photoshop and Illustrator all open at the same time, plus you know 20 other Chrome tabs, then the 5600X is going to give you problems long before the 10900K would or the 12-core 5900X, or the 16-core 5950X for that matter. The second thing, and this is really important, is that Adobe recently announced that they're bringing back multi-core rendering support in Adobe After Effects. Now it's currently in beta at the time we're filming this, but the current results are quite promising. When finished, this will allow RAM previews, final exports, and even dynamic links and mogurts to break up their workload so that multiple frames are being rendered at once on different CPU cores. This is really exciting. It means that the more cores you have on your processor, the bigger a leap in performance you can get from this update. This is part of the reason why I felt that it was justified to go straight for the 5950X with 16 cores, as it will see a bigger gain once this feature becomes mainstream. We'll be sure to do a more in-depth video once that feature comes out of beta. With that stuff out of the way, I want to talk about some of the common gotchas and frustrations you may run into when actually assembling a new Ryzen system. If you're getting a new motherboard for a Ryzen 5000, just go ahead and get either a B550 or an X570 board. Those are the names of the newest chipsets that support the new Ryzen processors. And they are the least likely to give you any annoying headaches. However, even though they are new, it is very likely that many of these boards that you buy will not have the correct internal firmware, something that's also known as the BIOS or basic input-output system, to run the new chips. It used to be the case that in order to upgrade motherboards like this to get them working properly, you need to plug in some other older processor to upgrade it. And this is no longer the case as nearly all mainstream boards now support updating the BIOS without plugging in a processor. The step-by-step -step is a little different for each board, so I'd double check first that your board supports this before buying it, and then consulting the manual or specific guides online for how to do it. The next thing I wanna talk about is that if you're interested in having a PC that natively supports Thunderbolt, not just USB Type-C, but true 40 gigabits per second Thunderbolt, then there are a few options that are available to you. This is a list of boards that currently support Thunderbolt, but these are the ones where you need to buy a specific fairly pricey add-in card to make them work. 
and on some of them you need an additional special header that is only present on some revisions of the board. So it's possible to buy one of these motherboards and not even get the one that supports Thunderbolt, which is really annoying. However, these few boards are the ones that actually have a couple of Thunderbolt ports directly on the back of the motherboard itself. This means no special add-in card and no additional complications. The B550 Vision D is actually the motherboard I got, as it is the one that Puget Systems has been recommending for their builds, and it has the two Thunderbolt ports on the back. The next thing I want to talk about is RAM, or memory. In previous generations of AMD processors, RAM speed was raised on high as being super, super extremely important. And this is because AMD makes their processors a little different than Intel does. Instead of having one big die that the whole chip is printed on, AMD actually makes a number of smaller chiplets that are put together in various amounts for different product SKUs. These chiplets communicate through something that is very dramatically called the Infinity Fabric. A long story short, the Infinity Fabric is tied to the speed of the memory, normally half whatever the memory is. I say all that, but oh my gosh, has this stuff been blown out of proportion. Puget has done multiple tests and shown that RAM speed means so very little in real world editing performance. Just a word of advice, do not get obsessed with all the RAM speed and timing stuff. Get a set of RAM that is listed as compatible with your motherboard at the size that you want at probably at least 3200 megahertz if you just wanna be safe and you should be good to go. If you're new to this and don't plan on overclocking or doing anything crazy, 3600 megahertz is the highest I would go. It'll run one-to-one -one with the Infinity Fabric, you won't have to mess around with anything, and it should just work. The last thing I want to talk about is something called Precision Boost. This is AMD's boost technology. Intel has a similar thing that they call Turbo Boost. Basically, these are algorithms that dynamically increase the processor's working speed in quick bursts in order to get small tasks done quickly. This is normal behavior on nearly all modern processors. What makes Precision Boost a little different, especially as it's being implemented on these newer chips, is that it is a fair bit more aggressive. It takes temperatures into consideration and, depending on the workload, will boost further and for longer. I want to emphasize that this is not overclocking, this is intended behavior, and Precision Boost will never push your processor in a way that is dangerous. The result of this, however, can be counterintuitive sometimes. I'm used to seeing the highest temperatures happen when I slam my processor with something like ADA64, which is a stress test designed to fully load up the processor. But that won't always happen. At least with my 5950X, things that loaded up all of the cores at once caused the algorithm to not push the processor as far on each individual core, and so the temperatures were lower. However, if I did something aggressively single-threaded or using just a few cores, I would see the clocks on those cores jump up really high and then there would be a temperature spike that followed. Then, if I jumped into like a video game for example, which would cause the GPU to dump even more heat into the system, it would get even higher. And AMD has publicly said that higher temperatures in this way are normal and to be expected. Precision Boost is just optimizing your processor for different workloads. This leads me directly into Precision Boost Overdrive, which is often confused with the regular Precision Boost, but they are quite different. Precision Boost is the default and intended behavior. Precision Boost Overdrive is a way of tuning the boost algorithm to make it even more uh, aggressive. I played around with it for quite some time, and while there were a number of cool settings in there, and I was able to make a noticeable bump in performance in some benchmarks, I never saw a measurable difference in Premiere or After Effects. I did notice the temperature increase though. The reason I bring this up at all really is because of how often I saw people online get PBO confused with the basic Precision Boost. Precision Boost Overdrive is technically a method of overclocking, though it is a pretty unique way of doing it. If you aren't interested in tinkering with your computer in that way, then don't mess with it. If you are, then there are plenty of other guides online for how to go about it. I do want to mention that, on my motherboard at least, the default setting for PBO was auto, which was just a weird circular way of saying off. I swapped back and forth a couple of times to confirm that auto just means off. Not sure why they even bothered having that option to be honest, but just to let you know if that's the way your motherboard is as well. Anyways, that's all the stuff I have for you today. I hope this was helpful and that it provided some meaningful insight that you're going to be able to use if you do get your hands on a Ryzen 5000 processor. This new line of chips is pretty dang cool, so I really do hope the stock issues clear up into the future. Please like, comment, subscribe, and all that stuff. Thanks for stopping by, and I'll see you in the next one.